Hello everyone, my name is Jeff Wera. I'm a Northern Kentucky native, and I'm here to talk to you about two of the most common causes of hand and finger pain. I originally went to Beechwood High School, and then I went, to, I did my medical school training at University of Louisville, and then I went and did my orthopedic and sports medicine uh, residency training at Temple University in Philadelphia. I completed my training at the University of Pittsburgh and completed it in a hand and upper extremity fellowship. So one of the most common causes of hand pain is carpal tunnel syndrome. A lot of people have it, and I'm here to talk to you today about it. We're gonna go over anatomy, the etiology or the causes of it, different symptoms that you may have or experience, how do we diagnose it, and ultimately what we do to treat it. So the carpal tunnel is in your wrist it's a small area, it's a cylindrical area that contains many flexor tendons that allow you to bend your fingers, and it is surrounded by the carpal bones. So three sides of the box do not allow any kind of movement whatsoever. So if you have any kind of swelling or positional changes, that can put pressure on the nerve, and that can cause numbness and tingling and pain. And so different things that may change that can cause pressure in there would be any kind of synovitis or inflammation around the soft tissues there, positional changes, uh, or any kind of inflammation in the nerve. So why do you have these symptoms? The most common cause of it is unknown. It's called idiopathic. It means it just happens. Sometimes people with distal radius or wrist fractures can uh, experience carpal tunnel complaints, and that's because of the pressure from the swelling, the hematoma or the blood collection that presses on the nerve. Inflammatory conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis or gout can deposit substances within the carpal tunnel that can cause pressure on the nerve. There's also metabolic causes. Diabetes can affect the nerve health by affecting the blood flow to the nerve. And then thyroid disorders can also affect it. Fluid changes such as during pregnancy in young females can also contribute to it. A lot of times these resolve, but it's not uncommon that people will then develop symptoms later in life. Also, hemodialysis can also contribute to it as well, too. So what are some of the symptoms that you could be experiencing if you have carpal tunnel? Paresthesias or dysthesias. This is also known as just that painful, irritable discomfort that you feel in your hand and fingers. Pain is a very common complaint. Weakness is usually long-standing carpal tunnel that's causing the nerve uh, health and affecting the ability for the thumb to move. A lot of times people complain of nocturnal or nighttime numbness and tingling, which is, leads us into our next uh, symptom. Positional changes can cause this. And a lot of times when you sleep, you flex your wrist down, which can put the pressure on the nerve. If you extend your wrist when you're driving or you're flexing your wrist at nighttime, that can increase the pressure in the carpal tunnel by threefold. A lot of times people will complain of fasciculations or muscle twitching. And then dexterity issues is another common complaint where people are having a hard time with fine motor tasks or feeling small objects when their hands are in their pockets or they're trying to write or lift uh, or pick up a piece of paper. Uh, swelling and pressure is another common complaint where they, people may feel just kind of um, pressure and swelling within their hands in the morning time. And then most importantly, we have to determine whether or not your complaints or symptoms are coming from your neck, your shoulder, or your hand. So a lot of times we see people that have seen neck surgeons and uh, shoulder surgeons. And so then it's a team approach to determine what truly is causing the symptoms. So how do we diagnose it? Well, a lot of it's by physical examination. So we look at your hand to see if there's any atrophy or muscle wasting, meaning that the muscles are not as strong or as big as they once were. We check your strength to see if there's any weakness associated with your complaints. Tenels, that's when we tap on the nerve. You can see the picture where we tap on the nerve and if it's an irritable nerve or compressed, that can send shock waves into your fingers. And then compression testing is when we try to irritate the nerve to see if it's truly compressed. And so by us pressing on it, just makes it more compressed and then um, recreates your symptoms. And then ultimately the gold standard for diagnosis is if we suspect that you have carpal tunnel, we send patients for electrodiagnostic studies to see the severity uh, of the compression of the nerve. A lot of the times, this will help us tell us if this is coming from the neck or if it's coming from the wrist, or if for some other reason you have a peripheral neuropathy uh, that may not be associated with carpal tunnel, it might be a different nerve altogether. 
So you may ask, how do you treat carpal tunnel? Well, early and mild symptoms we can treat non-operatively. The majority of patients get better with wrist splinting at nighttime because of the changes in your wrist position. A lot of people sleep with their wrist flexed and that increases the pressure on the nerve. And so a simple brace that keeps your wrist straight at nighttime can help alleviate those symptoms. Stretching exercises can actually help as well too because of all the flexor tendons that are inside of your carpal tunnel, stretching those and uh, can actually alleviate some of the symptoms as well too. Another option potentially could be an injection. Injections work by injecting a steroid medication into the carpal tunnel and that alleviates some of the pressure there by decreasing the inflammation of the nerve and the surrounding structures. Ultimately, however, if all those fail or if you have severe carpal tunnel seen on electrodiagnostic studies or if there's muscle wasting where the thumb muscles start to decrease in size, we would be concerned about non-operative treatment not working for you. And that's when we would talk about possibly doing an operation. The operation that we do to release the pressure on the nerve is called an open carpal tunnel release. A lot of times we can do this under local anesthesia, meaning you get numbing medication only and you're awake during it. Or if you'd like, a lot of times people uh, request for light sedation so they're sleeping during the case. Typically we keep the sutures in for seven to 14 days. On average, it's about 10 days, but we wanna make sure that the incision heals before we take the incision the stitches out. So the next most common cause of hand and finger pain is called trigger finger. Again, we'll talk about the anatomy, the etiology or the causes of it, symptoms that you may have, the diagnosis and the treatment options. To talk about trigger finger anatomy, we have to talk about the flexor tendons. The flexor tendons are essentially like ropes that connect to your muscles and then attach into your fingertips. And this allows your fingers to bend. The tendons are surrounded by something called a pulley system. The pulley system is essentially small tunnels through which the tendons travel. And so if there's any inflammation around there, this can cause dysfunction of the flexor tendons. So the question is, what happens first? Is it a tendon issue or is it a pulley issue? Sometimes the pulley system can get fibrotic or stiffened and it doesn't allow the tendons to glide as smoothly. And sometimes it's inflammation around the tendons that prevent the tendons from gliding smoothly through the pulleys. So what causes trigger fingers? Well, there's a lifetime risk of two to 3% for the population. Diabetic patients have a higher uh, incidence of trigger fingers. Some reports of up to 20% of the diabetic population will experience trigger fingers. Women are six times more likely than men to experience trigger fingers. And then there's a high concordance of having carpal tunnel syndrome along with trigger fingers. Gout can be associated with it, renal disease, hypothyroidism, and rheumatologic diseases. Anything that places more stress or more inflammation or deposits any kind of substances around the tendons can cause trigger fingers. So how do we diagnose trigger fingers? So the most common uh, early complaint that we see in patients is pain at the A1 pulley. That's the pulley specifically that we are uh, dealing with in trigger fingers, and that's right at the knuckle uh, at the base of the hand. And that is a grade one trigger finger. If you only have pain at the A1 pulley, a lot of patients will experience clicking or catching of the digits when they try to bend their finger down. And then if it's really bad trigger finger, that's a grade three trigger finger, and that's when your finger actually gets stuck down and you have to passively open up your finger. And then the most extreme case of trigger finger would be a grade four, and that's when your finger is stuck in your palm and you can't move it. A lot of times grade four trigger fingers will not respond to non-operative treatment. How do we treat trigger fingers? Well, again, we can treat trigger fingers without surgery. Splinting at nighttime helps with trigger finger. Uh, therapy can, uh, can also alleviate some of your symptoms as well too, but the majority of the time we treat patients with injections. So injections consist of steroids and numbing medication. The numbing medication obviously makes it more comfortable for the injection, and the steroid medication will decrease the inflammation around the tendon to allow it to glide more smoothly. Some patients respond and essentially have their symptoms resolved with one injection, and sometimes patients require a second injection. If two injections fail to resolve your symptoms, we will then discuss surgery.
So that brings me to the next treatment option, and that is an operation. We would perform an operation for failed conservative management. So if you don't get any better with injections, splinting, or stretching exercises, we would talk about potentially releasing the pulley system at the A1 pulley in the palm. And we do this under local anesthesia and the numbing medication only, and you're awake during this case. Again, the sutures stay in for approximately 10 days, and you can see in the picture that the uh, incision is approximately two centimeters long in the palm of the hand, and we basically find the pulley system or the tunnel through which it passes, and we release it, allowing the tendon to glide more smoothly. So what to expect postoperatively for carpal tunnel or trigger fingers? Well, we place you in a soft room, uh, dressing for 72 hours, and you can remove that after the 72 hours is up. You're allowed to get the incision wet. We just don't uh, want you to soak it in any water. We would remove the stitches at the time of your first post-operative appointment, and then we'll have you progress to scar massage to allow the uh, tissues to glide more smoothly under the skin. Typically, it only requires one visit uh, to remove the stitches, and then if there's any stiffness associated with your surgery, then we would have you see our hand therapy colleagues. Alrighty, thank you so much for joining us today to talk about carpal tunnel and trigger fingers. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to call our office or if you're experiencing these symptoms. Next up is gonna be Sandy Stevens and she's gonna to talk to you about non-operative management and hand therapy associated with these conditions. Hi, I'm Sandy Stevens. I'm an occupational therapist at St. Elizabeth Hospital, and I work closely with the orthopedic surgeons, hand surgeons at Orthosensi. I'm speaking with you tonight about hand therapy for carpal tunnel syndrome and trigger finger. To let you know a little bit about myself, I graduated from Indiana University in 1986 with, with an occupational therapy degree. I went on to work mostly in outpatient therapy and doing hand therapy and also specializing in work programs and ergonomics. My jobs I worked at the biggest chunks of time were at St. Elizabeth Now for four years, before that at Dartmouth-Hitchcock in New Hampshire, and before that at Ephraim McDowell in Danville, Kentucky. I have a specialty in ergonomics and a hand certification as well. So what is hand therapy? Hand therapy, Hand therapists are either occupational therapists or physical therapists. We have a, additional training in upper extremity injuries and rehab. We also have a certification for, for hand therapy. And as I mentioned, we work very closely with our hand surgeons. Between the hand surgeons and the therapists, we like to have real good communication to have best outcome of care. We work with patients to decrease pain and swelling and to improve their range of motion and their function. And we spend a good deal of time getting to know how to return you back to your previous function. I'm gonna start off talking about conservative treatment for carpal tunnel and trigger finger, and that means without surgery. The goal of therapy is to relieve symptoms and getting pressure off the nerve for carpal tunnel and pressure off the tendon for trigger finger. We start off with evaluation. In evaluation, we look at what your problem areas are and what kinds of things are provoking your symptoms, like what activities you do that may be making them worse. We spend time getting to know you and what you do as far as how we can modify your activities, also teach you stretches that will help with your symptoms, and we may recommend bracing or splinting. Some common positions that provoke carpal tunnel are things I wanna talk about. One is prolonged repetitive gripping or pinching. Such things as doing crafts, gardening, shopping, chopping, riding, driving, gripping things tightly like weights. Also prolonged or repetitive extreme wrist extension or flexion. Examples are that are when you're sleeping at night and your hands are curled up, puts pressure on the nerve, or if your hand is extended under your pillow, stretches the nerve. In therapy, we will work on modifying your activities a common thing would be to modify the tools that you use. We have a larger grip. We may wrap grippy tape around the handle so you don't have to grip so hard. Examples would be hammers and gardening tools that you use. We also will teach you how to break and take stretch breaks to allow the, the nerve and tendons to relax in your wrist. 
With your stretch breaks, you'll want to do stretching and stop if you start feeling tingling or numbness with activity. Consider changing positions of your activity so that your wrist is in a more neutral position and your fingers are relaxed. A common exercise, very simple that you can do, is called the prayer stretch. You do this activity before, during, and after you do repetitive activity. We'll keep the tendons and nerve relaxed. Be careful not to overdo the stretch because it can make your fingers go more numb if you go too far with it. A lot of people ask, should I squeeze a stress ball, would that help? And the answer is definitely not because that actually can reduce, increase your symptoms and make things worse. Splinting is one treatment modality that has been proven to be the most helpful for managing carpal tunnel conservatively. If you would wear a splint at night when you're sleeping for at least four to six weeks, that would be a good indication as to if that's gonna help. Positioning your median nerve in a more neutral slack position while you sleep can help healing and calming down the nerve. You may want to purchase a prefabricated splint or see a hand therapist to have you make a custom splint for you. And the picture on the, on the screen here is one example of one you could order online. I'm gonna talk about trigger finger now. So common positions that can aggravate trigger finger, real similar to carpal tunnel. There's such things as prolonged repetitive gripping and pinching. Again, crafts, gardening, riding, driving, holding a steering wheel tightly, using weights or any activity that causes your finger to trigger. Again, we'll talk about modifying activities. Same thing as with carpal tunnel, trying to keep a loose grasp on your tools and things you're doing, and also reducing repetitive activities that elicit your finger to trigger. Prayer stretch is another good stretch. It relaxes the tendon that goes through the finger and, and causes it to trigger. You want to be careful not to overdo the stretch again and gripping and squeezing a, a stress ball would not be helpful. Splinting can be very beneficial. This picture on the slide indicates one example of a splint that will help position the tendon in a more relaxed position. We can also make a fabricated one in therapy for you. Carpal tunnel syndrome and trigger finger. In summary, carpal tunnel and trigger finger are both inflammatory conditions in therapy, we try to reduce the inflammation and relieve the pressure on the nerve for carpal tunnel and pressure on the tendon for trigger finger. Hand therapy can help identify what activities aggravate your symptoms and how to calm them down. We can fabricate or recommend splints and we can all help take the pressure off the nerve. If conservative treatment did not help your symptoms, we would recommend you see a hand surgeon for evaluation. If they suggest surgery, we'd see you after surgery, and we'd address your wound and scar care. We'd also go through the same similar activities as far as stretching, splinting, getting your symptoms under control, and ultimately work on strengthening and returning you back to your full function. Thank you for watching this presentation. I hope it's been very helpful for you. If for any reason you have questions or concerns, feel free to call us at St. Elizabeth Hand Therapy and we'd be happy to help you. Thank you.